And Pastor Reader's absence uh, this morning, he's away in St. Louis. He's wrapping up a conference there, and he's preaching uh, this morning, then he'll travel back this afternoon. In his absence, we have Dr. Peter Lilback, certainly no stranger to Broward Presbyterian Church, a friend of, of the church. He was, benefited from his preaching and his teaching and his leadership for many years. He's the president of Westminster Theological Seminary, so we're glad to have Dr. Lilbeck with us. Would you give him a Briarwood welcome? Yeah. Praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. Well, thank you so much for the privilege of being with you. Uh, the worship has been such a delight, I have to take a moment and get my composure here. I've been fighting the tears in both services. The, the worship is just wafting over me, and my heart is lifted up into the presence of God. What a great joy. It's an honor to be with this congregation that has become so dear to us. Uh, you have uh, blessed us with your pastors being on the board at Westminster, including uh, ruling elders who served with us. And so our hearts are knit together in the work of the gospel. And on behalf of all of our Westminster community, thanks for being such a dear uh, group of friends in Christ for the mission that God has given to us. We come here to worship this great and glorious Lord. And we've had a vision of what heaven looks like. And I want us to hear again the reading of God's holy word as we turn now to Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to read beginning at verse 1 through the whole chapter. So please hear now God's holy and inspired word. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and take its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language, and people, and nation. And you have made them a kingdom, and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Thus far the reading of God's word. Would you pray with me? Father, would you please let us see the glory of your Son through the gracious ministry and illuminating grace of your Holy Spirit. Oh Lord, we ask now that your word might dwell in us richly and that we'd use it mightily in our lives for your glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The mystery of the apocalypse is extraordinary. We come in this book to a stage where suddenly the curtains open and we see things that human beings cannot see. The word 
Revelation means an unveiling. Apocalypsis. It is this idea that something is beyond our ken, beyond our knowledge, has now become accessible. And it is remarkable to remember that this vision comes to the Apostle John when he is in exile. He is on the small, rocky island of Patmos, which is out in the sea west of ancient Ephesus. Here he is, he is abandoned, he is forgotten. He could have been martyred, but they put him far away so his faith and his ideas can harm no one. And as far as we can tell, there's only one known cave on the Isle of Patmos, and it must have been the place where this exiled apostle found himself sitting. And there is a rock that is flat there. They call it St. John's Desk in that cave. And they say if he ever wrote anything in this place, it had to be on this spot. And so here he is feeling certainly abandoned, alone, wondering what will happen. And suddenly the heavens open up with a glorious vision. It's the vision of the risen Christ. It is so magnificent that we cannot possibly conceive of it. But John says it as if the living Christ came and his face shone like the sun in all of his brightness. His feet were glowing as though it were molten metal, and here he finds himself so overcome that he falls on his face as though dead. He feels the hand of the sovereign Lord touch him and raising him, if you will, back to life. And he's given a vision of the things that were and are and that shall come afterwards. This glorious vision now is one in which the Lord says, John, I want you to be my amanuensis. I want you to take the time, and you are going to write letters to the seven churches across Asia Minor and Western Turkey. They need to hear from the risen Christ, epistles that have a message just for them. And John has the privilege of taking down these letters and writing them. But then something far greater happens. As he has heard these words that are intended for the church to be sent on letters, Suddenly, he looks up. Can you imagine this in the darkness of a cave lit by some sort of a lamp? Suddenly, the cave opens up, and he looks up, and he's looking into heaven. And he sees that there is a door standing open. It's wide open, and no one is guarding it. And he's given the privilege to come up and look closely. In fact, there's a voice that says, come up here. And John is given this a glorious vision of the throne room of heaven itself. As we come to chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, we discover that he is able to see the throne room of the one who's seated on the throne surrounded by four glorious beings, 24 elders, innumerable angels, and the worship of God goes on in extraordinary manner. What a wonderful scene this is. John goes, if you will, from the dark and dingy dungeon of a cave to the glorious sense of God's own throne room and rule. He was worshiping. When we come together in spirit and truth, do you know that the roof of this church opens up, the heavens and its distance disappear, and we are now in the presence of the angels? They're here with us. The Holy Spirit is pouring out His grace upon us because His Word is being opened. The living Christ is coming to speak to us, and we are in the presence of the triune God. Are you prepared to receive the presence of the King of the universe? He's now with us. He's here, and we are before Him. This was John's experience, and we come to verse 1 of Revelation 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. This I would humbly suggest to you, gives us the picture of the utter distance between all mankind and the glory of God. Do you realize this 
scroll is in the presence of four glorious creatures that are around the throne. There are 24 elders that rule, if you will, the people of God. There are unfallen angels by innumerable hosts surrounding, and the scroll is in the right hand of the one upon the throne, and none of them are worthy. Perfect angelic beings present in the very throne room of God, and no one is able to be worthy to come forward to touch it. The glorious beings are impure in the sight of this Holy One. Do you remember the image of Isaiah chapter 6? The angels that surround the throne of God saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. With two wings they fly in service. With two wings they cover their face because in their perfection they're not perfect enough to gaze upon God in His glory. With two wings they cover their feet lest their feet be found to be inadequate in the presence of one so majestic. And here we are now in his throne room. Who is worthy? No one. And so we find that John, overcome with the extraordinary concatenation of events that takes him from the dark, dingy cave of Patmos and now into the throne room of the universe in the presence of Almighty God, and he sees this glory and he realizes how far removed he is. He could not dare step forward. He could not imagine it, but he could weep. And in verse 4 he says, I begin to weep. And the Greek text says, I begin to weep and to weep loudly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. If we would let that passage just roll over us theologically for a moment, the Scriptures say there are none righteous, no, not one. There is not one who is able to come into the presence of God. If the angels and the heavenly hosts that surround the magnificent ultra transcendent glorious holy presence of God cannot come and hold this scroll to look at God how much less we could possibly come we understand the tears of John yes there are tears in heaven and John is weeping them he's saying who can do this who could ever come to such a holy glorious transcendent God and we read again in verse 5 and one of the elders said to me, weep no more. I said, stop your weeping. Behold, turn your eyes from the scroll that cannot be touched or taken or opened and read, but instead turn your eyes elsewhere and behold, there is a lion. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the root of David. Put that together. This one who is here is the one who actually was promised from Judah's time, from Israel, that there would be a king from the tribe of Judah. But he is not just promised from antiquity. David, who came on the scene, found his origin in him. He is, in fact, the one who has already conquered the enemies of God's throne. And so we must think about this scene. Many biblical scholars think this is Ascension Sunday in heaven. This is when the Lord Jesus Christ, having finished his work of coming to the cross, descending into the grave and into hell, and then rising again and walking among his disciples and then ascending into the glory of heaven. This is the day he comes back to heaven as the redeeming lion of the tribe of Judah. He's fulfilled all that was promised for the Messiah. He has conquered. He's conquered Satan. He's conquered sin. He's conquered death. He is the risen one. He is the one who is life itself. And so he is the one who is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. It's an extraordinary vision. Did you know that the university in Oxford, England, has its, for its symbol in the Bodleian Library, its great library, it has the seal, or the scroll with seven seals open. I had the joy to go study in the Bodleian Library some years ago 
I had a day to be there, and I thought, what will I do with this extraordinary opportunity? And I said, I know what I want to do. I want to find one of the illuminated manuscripts of John Wycliffe. Remember the man who first translated the Bible into English? And so I spent the afternoon poring over this ancient manuscript. What a great opportunity. So this ancient library has as its seals uh, that it puts in front of everyone that comes to tour, if you will, a scroll that is opened with seven seals. And so as I went on the tourist tour so I could learn more about it, the, the guide stopped and said, does anybody know what this represents? There's dead silence. And being a student of the Bible, I said, well, sir, it looks to me like it's the scroll from the apocalypse, that this is the scroll that was open. He said, that's wonderful. I'm glad someone knows that story. And I said, sir, may I ask you a question? He said, of course. He said, why are the seals broken and hanging down? He looked at me with a quizzical question. I said, it's because Jesus has come to Oxford. He's opened the seals. He looked very stunned. He said, well, let's continue our tour, please. <laughs> he knew the story only in part. The book of Revelation is the story of the only one worthy in all of history who can come to the throne of God and not humbly receive the scroll, but to take it. He can approach the throne because he is equal in power and glory with the one upon the throne. The lamb, the lion, the son of God is in fact God of God, very God of very God, begotten, not made, not created. He is the eternal son of God. So he comes and he takes the scroll and it's amazing to see the scene, but notice carefully when we look at verse 6. It says, and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw not a lion. Remember, the lion of the tribe of Judah. It says, no, it's a lamb. How very different a lion is from a lamb. This is a lamb that represents the sacrificial system. It's a lamb who's standing and yet he has been slain, one who's died and one who has been raised to life. We are reminded here as we put this story in the wonderful revelation of salvation through the scriptures of that extraordinary scene in Genesis 22. Do you remember now Abraham, the father of nations, is an old man. He's awaited his entire life for the promised a seed that was going to come to him. He finally has his son. He's a young adult, maybe 18, 19 years of age. He is, if you will, strong, and his father is old. And they go off to offer sacrifice. The son's name is Yitzhak, meaning laughter. The one who brought laughter to the home. The one who was going to bring joy in fulfilling God's promise of a seed and a blessing that would come to Abraham that would bless the nations. And now the Lord has said to him, take this very only begotten son and take him to a place I will show you, Mount Moriah, which happens to be right in the heart of Jerusalem. Take him and offer him as a sacrifice. And you remember that extraordinary story. I still remember the Bible storybook. I read that in as a child, almost having nightmares when a father has the knife coming down ready to slay his son. I had to hear the story. It was terrifying. And then I heard the resurrection message it brings. But you remember what laughter or Yitzhak said? He said, Father, here's the knife. Here's the wood. Here's the fire. But where's the lamb? He said, my son, the Lord will provide the lamb. And a willing, only begotten son allowed himself to be bound by an old father and placed upon the altar. He was a willing sacrifice. And there as he's laid and the knife is ready to come down, the voice from heaven says, stop! I know that you fear me. There is a substitute for your son. And there caught in the thicket was a ram 
who is then slain to spare the son. Now, it's quite remarkable as we think about this. The question that Laughter or Yitzhak asked has echoed down the corridors of history for millennia. Where is the lamb? There was a ram, but not a lamb. And as the ages went by, there were many sacrifices. Where is the lamb? And finally, we come to that moment when the forerunner of the Messiah, John the Baptist, says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It is this lion of the tribe of Judah who becomes the lamb that was asked about all the way back in Abraham's day. And now he's ascended into glory as the one who came as the sacrifice who's been raised again to heaven. And he is the ascended lamb standing even though he had been slain. For when he went to the cross, there was no substitute for him as there had been for Isaac. Jesus was the Savior. He was the substitute. He was the ram caught in the thicket. He was the lamb that was asked about. He is the lamb of God who alone can take away the sins of the world. And so this is the lamb that we must see who now is taking this scroll out of the hands of the Father with full equality. He's won the right. He alone is worthy. And so as you look at your own life and you say, what will make you worthy to stand before God? The Bible say, it is not by works of righteousness which we have done. No, our good works cannot boast before the Father. We come as humble beggars. It is, as Martin Luther said so long ago, we are humble beggars reaching out our hands to receive a gift from a king. What is the gift we receive? The perfect righteousness of our substitute, Jesus Christ. But this substitute who is perfect, he is able to reach out and take the scroll and make it his own. He is the Redeemer, the Lamb, who is to rule over us as the Lion. And so as we look at this scene in verse 6, it says, In between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. He's been raised, even though he's been slain, and he has seven horns. He has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, one of the beauties of apocalyptic literature is that the numbers are symbolic, but the symbols have real meaning. They're not just throwaway pictures. So we have to ask the question, what does it mean that he has seven horns? The horns are a symbol of power and authority. And seven is the number of perfection from the creation, and it's repeated repeatedly throughout the apocalypse, the book of Revelation. What it's saying is that he has complete power. He is omnipotent. He is divine. He has all the power of God. And further, he not only has seven horns, he has seven eyes. The eyes of the Lord are going through the earth looking for a heart that will please him. He has a perfect knowledge of the earth. He does not just have knowledge, he has omniscience, all knowledge. He has all power. He has all knowledge. He has the attributes of deity. No wonder he can come before the Father and take the scroll. For he is God of God, very God, begotten, not made, who became man and humbled himself to dwell among us and has been raised to glory. He is fully God and fully man in one person. This is the one who comes before the Father. And it's the spirit that he has, seven spirits of God, the perfection of the spirit. Because on the day of Pentecost, when he has now poured out the spirit after his ascension, the spirit is fully his and he sent him out to make disciples of all the nations. Do you remember what it says? Remain in Jerusalem, and when the Spirit comes, I will make you witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The Spirit comes from Christ, elevating Christ, sending out his message throughout the world. We see here the sovereign Lord, who is the lion, who is the lamb who is slain standing, who sends forth out of his sovereign power 
the fullness of the Spirit that is right here with us. We worship him in spirit and in truth. We are surrounded with a great cloud of witnesses that are around us, worshiping with us. Because this lion lamb has given us a spirit that unites us with those who've gone before. We are in the presence of deity. We are at that throne today. It is God himself who is speaking by his spirit to you and to your heart. And by his spirit, he's drawing his people to himself. And so we see in verse 7 this sovereign, divine, incarnate, crucified, slain, risen, ascended, glorious one who comes before the Father. And we see he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. It is his scroll, it is his to take. He shares it with the one on the throne. Now we have to ask the question, what is that scroll? I'll wait and let you ask that of Dr. Reeder. It has to do with what's going to happen in the future. How many seals have been opened? Are they yet to be done? But this has to do with the sovereign purpose of the lion lamb over all of history. It is his story now. He's bringing on the glory of the kingdom of God. But what we do want to see in this next verse 8 says, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now we stop and think about that image, which is so remarkable. He has the ability to say, the scroll is mine. And these glorious creatures that worship only God, they surround the throne of the sovereign of the universe. What do they do with the 24 elders? You could say the 24 Presbyterians who did make it to heaven. No, that's not true. These are the rulers of heaven. Same word, though, presbyters. They fall down and they worship the Lamb. How can they worship the Lamb? Because he's God. He is fully God and fully man in one person. And as they come and worship before the Lamb, they're holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense. Now notice this phrase carefully, which are the prayers of the saints. They're your prayers, and they're my prayers. Your worship today makes it all the way to the throne room of God. What you do right now, here today, is up there because we are in the presence of God. He meets with us here. I'm reminded of a remarkable story that was told. There was a kingdom that was famous for the uh, vineyards that they had and the marvelous wine that they produced. It was a day when the king was going to have a marriage for his son, the prince, who would succeed him to the throne. He had a beautiful bride. The wedding day came, and in preparation for it, months ahead of time, they asked all of the region with all of its famous wine to come and bring their best bottle of wine, and they would mix them all together in a large vat, and everyone would partake in the beautiful sharing of this magnificent wine that was unique to their kingdom. The day day came, and the king went to gather the first cup of this extraordinary vintage of his kingdom, and out came water. He was troubled. He asked for another cup, and out came water. It was as if the miracle of the water turned into wine, and now became the miracle of the wine turned into the water. He said, what happened? They opened up the vat, and they discovered only water was inside, and suddenly they all understood what had happened. One person said, no one will notice if I just bring water and keep the best wine for myself. Everyone had brought water and had not brought the wine. And so as we think about that parable, could it be possible that on a particular day here at Briarwood Presbyterian Church that our beloved Dr. Harry Reeder says, I'm just so busy today. I don't have time to pray like I normally do. But I'm so glad we have this great pastoral staff. I know they'll be praying. 
And the pastoral staff says, Dr. Reeder keeps us so busy around here. Uh, we don't have time to pray, but I'm so glad that the elders are praying. And the elders are saying, man, we're going through a capital campaign and all of the visitation. We just don't have time to pray. I'm so glad the deacons are praying. And the deacons say, there's so many needs around here, we can't take time to pray. I'm so glad the congregation is praying. The congregation says, man, we're so busy trying to do our day-to-day -day work so we can support the church. I'm so glad Pastor Reeder is praying. And on that day, there was no prayers that ascended to heaven. The prayers of heaven are the incense, and the incense ran out. Is that possible? I can't imagine it would be possible here, but it just might be. We have forgotten the priesthood of the believer, that our prayers are so precious that they ascend right into the highest, most glorious worship in the universe, the throne room of God and the presence of the risen Christ and the unfallen elders and creatures that surround the throne, the angelic host. It's our prayers that they pour out before the King of kings and Lord of lords. Do you realize what you do right now matters in heaven? As insignificant as each of us might feel, as unimportant as we are, you are a priest. You are a royal son and daughter, and your prayers ascend to the very throne room of God. Are they being offered? Your worship matters. I loved how the late R.C. Sproul used to say, what we do right now matters forever. Because we live coram Deo. We live face to face through our prayers with the living God. Well, based upon this prayers before the lion lamb who's in the heavens, it says in verse 9, and they sang a new song, a song that had never been sung before, a song that actually is only possible because of the crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, ascension Sunday in heaven. Here they are now singing it for the very first time, and it says, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. What an extraordinary song that is, only possible after the completion of the work of our Savior. He alone is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, not just because of his divinity, but because of his incarnation, his substitutionary death, and his resurrection and ascension to glory. This could never happen in heaven until he was able to say, it is finished, and Father, I'm home. What an extraordinary moment in redemptive history this is. But would you look carefully what it says here, that the death of the Lamb who is slain and his blood is what ransomed people for God. If any of us ever hope to be in this divine presence of God in his throne room, you need this sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You need a savior. Your good works are not good enough. Your obedience to anybody or anything, even to God, it's not good enough. You need to be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And by his stripes, says Isaiah the prophet, we are healed. Have you come to the foot of the cross and said, Lord Jesus, let your blood sacrificed wash over me so that my sins, though they are scarlet, they may be white as snow. This is the good news that's offered to you. This is the cross. This is the resurrection. This is what lets us come, sinners that we are, into the presence to worship the living God. But would you notice even further how this cross that buys us back from sin, pays the price, it ransoms us. It is for us to be the people of God from every tribe and from every language and from every people and from every nation. 
As Reformed Christians, we are not afraid to say what the Bible says. When Jesus died, he did not just make salvation possible. He said, it is finished. It is paid in full. He took the place of the sinner for whom he died so that they will never bear the wrath of God. We believe that Jesus' death was effectual. It was precise. It was defined. It was intended for all those whom the Father has drawn out of every kindred, out of every people, out of every tribe, out of every nation. It is universal in its scope, but it's particular in its intent and design to redeem every one of God's people. Does that not make you want to worship that this death of Christ was intended for you as a believer? It was not just some general message out there. It was intended to redeem you who are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved wretches like us who were not seeking God, but God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And when he did this, verse 10, he has made them, made us, a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. As we bring this marvelous passage of God's saving work through the lion and the lamb to a conclusion, do you realize that you are royalty? You are sons and daughters of the King of kings and Lord of lords. But you're also ministers. You're also ordained by the gospel to go out and do the work. We call it the priesthood of the believer. You just can't leave it to the pastoral staff at Briarwood. You say, no, I'm part of the team. I have been redeemed to be a priest, and I show this when I go out and serve. And that's how the reign of King Jesus is seen. We are in his courtroom right now. This is a royal gathering. Jesus is present. Where two or three are gathered in his name, they're here. The angels are watching. We are united with them by the Holy Spirit. We're here in court. We're going to be dismissed to go out. And we go out as sons and daughters of the king, as priests of his kingdom, of his worship. We let his message roll over our community. And we change the world with his glory, with his gospel, by elevating his name. Jesus said, if my name is lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Are you lifting up the name of Christ in what you do? Well, isn't that what they say in this worship? Then I looked and I heard around the throne of the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. This one who is ruling as the risen Christ, who is now receiving the praise of heaven, deserves it, all of us who are in his throne room here below. So I want to ask very specifically to each of us, are you willing to say if you're in a position of power, you're the CEO, you're the president, you're the authority of your firm, do you realize that what you have belongs to King Jesus and is to be used for him? Perhaps you have wealth. You have the extraordinary ability to uh, make things happen. Do you know that your wealth does not belong to you? It belongs to King Jesus. It's his wealth entrusted to you. It's to be put to work for his kingdom. You are his subject. He is your king. You are his prince. You are his princess. You are his priest, and you are to bring those gifts into his presence. Wisdom. Are you a college professor? Are you a legal mind? Are you an author? Are you a scholar? Your wisdom is not your own. It has been loaned to you to be used for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the king of everything, and this is what you bring. Power, wealth, wisdom, and might. Some of you have the power to make a command, and you can change your community because you're in an elected position. You have the ability to suggest something, and people jump because you have such an organization. Do you realize your might belongs to the mightier one, King Jesus? Today, as we come to this passage in the throne room of heaven, as we see the lion who is the lamb who comes to his people, he is calling on us to give him honor 
glory, and blessing. We live to pour out our lives for our king and not for ourselves. That is how we reign on the earth. When we go forth and we don't live for our own self-interest, but we live for that king that rules over all things, we begin to change the world. And that's what we're called to do with this gospel. Someday we're going to see the climax of it all. I would suggest this is an already and not yet as we come to the last few verses. And I heard, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Do you hear that crescendo? That's the entire universe now crying out what heaven is crying out. We now telescope from the ascension to the second coming. And on that day, I assure you, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some of you will not bow the knee seriously in your heart. You're here, but that's not your faith. I assure you the day will come when you will confess Jesus as the Lord. But it will be too late. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day to bow before the one before whom you will bow. Your knee will bow. Your tongue will confess. If the heavenly host fall on their face prostrate before his glory, let me assure you on that day of judgment when he comes in his full holiness and you stand without a redeemer, you'll fall flat on your face and you will say, I deserve what's coming to me. The Bible says this is the day of grace. This is the day to be like these heavenly creatures in verse 14 who said, amen, this is true. I believe this. It'll be like these elders who fell down and worshiped. Have you worshiped the lion lamb who's the Lord of all of history? If you do not today, I assure you you will someday. But now is the day of salvation. If you wait till that day, it will be the day of judgment and holiness. Jesus says, come unto me, all of you that are tired and heavy laden, because I'm the lamb who died in the place of sinners. And when you receive him, you must say, Lord, you are the lion. You're the king of the tribe of Judah. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Father, we thank you for the time to open your word now. We ask that you would speak to our hearts and that you would give us the ability to follow King Jesus. Lord, revive us again with his glory and his grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.